Good evening, church. Take a minute or two, let everybody get logged on. Hope everybody's having a good day today. Hey, Miss Charlotte. It's good to see you joining us. Take a few minutes to let folks get on, join us as we're coming together tonight. So one of the really odd things to do while you're doing Facebook Live is to watch it on Facebook Live. There's this real awkward delay. <laughs> so, kind of see what's going on, see a little bit bigger screen. How's everybody doing tonight? It's good to see you. Hi, Susie. Hope everybody's having a good day today. Uh, we'll take a few more minutes and then we will uh, kind of look over some prayer requests and a few announcements. I do not have many announcements, but I have a few. Uh, want to uh, Few and out. Let's see. Uh, I'll start the prayer list. Hi, Miss Jane. It's good to see you tonight. Let's we'll start the prayer list. Uh, and uh, I really, yeah, it's nice have like Earl said Sunday. It's just kind of nice having the, the the paper list. You know, on Wednesday nights when we we do the prayer list, we have the prayer sheet, and we have those names in front of us. Uh, I know there's a lot of people that we were praying for uh, prior to, uh, you know, the COVID-19 virus, and uh, we were looking at those and praying and updating every Wednesday night. We haven't been able to do that. See, March, April, May, June, here was like two and a half months now, and, uh, you know, here's the thing. God, God knows about all those prayers and those requests. But if you, if you know of anything, uh, any updates or some of the folks, if you have an old copy or, you know, the, the last copy of the prayer list that we had and uh, you want to, you know, want to share some updates, uh, you know, feel free to do that as well. Um, I know that uh, we want to continue to pray for uh, Chris Jenkins. Uh, Brother Chris had uh, his heart cap yesterday and, uh, you know, they, they still... Are searching for what's causing his shortness of breath but remember uh, him in your prayers remember his family uh, you know it's equally hard uh, on the family as well as they're kind of navigating through this and so make sure you pray for him and lift him up as well uh, I know uh, Miss Betty had uh, you know and her family they had several members uh, within her family that she requested prayer for on uh, Sunday and so uh, Remember, remember her and remember that family as well. Uh, I'd mentioned a pastor friend of mine, Brother Tim Collins, uh, in Bean Station, Tennessee. Uh, he was diagnosed with a, a rare case of lymphoma. If you would remember him and his family, remember that church, Adriel Baptist Church, some sweet people there, and, uh, and, and remember that family as well. Uh, I'm... I mean, we put everything else on social media, but I'm always hesitant about sharing, you know, prayer requests. There's HIPAA laws and everything about that, uh, you know, sharing prayer requests and who not to. And so I miss actually having the paper copy where we can kind of make notes and keep up with that. 
And so it's kind of hard not being able to do that. But if you have a prayer request, uh, please, you can, you can message that to me. And, uh, or you can email Dodie at the church office. And uh, I've asked her if she would go ahead and make her June calendar and maybe print out a few copies of that. I can actually put that on the website and I can actually put that on Facebook too as well as our June calendar. I know we don't have tons of things scheduled, right? Uh, but uh, we do have that. Also, uh, let me see, let me find it here if I can roll back a little bit. Ah. Naturally, when you're looking for something, uh, oh, the youth group, I want to know that uh, uh, Savannah put this on the Facebook page, but uh, the youth group's going to have their yard sale on June the 11th, 12th, and 13th. And if you would like to donate items to the yard sale, please get in touch with Savannah. Uh, all donations must be dropped off or picked up by June the 9th. And so uh, they're, they're, uh, they're going to clean up a lot of stuff. I know they got a lot of stuff over in the Family Life Center. They're trying to do that and, and get that taken care of. And, and so if you have questions, contact Savannah. Uh, you can send me a message on Facebook and I'll, I'll get that to her, but uh, she'll get it as well. And so if you have that, but uh, June 11th, 12th, and 13th, yard sale. Listen, I know that you've been inside and you've been doing a lot of house cleaning and you're like, what am I going to do with this stuff? That's awesome. Bring it to the yard sale because that way all the, uh, the money from the yard sale will go into the student ministry. I know that they're raring to go and uh, they're not going to get to go to camp. And uh, my camps, uh, I do have one camp at the end of July uh, that uh, is a separate camp from Lifeway and Form I normally do. Uh, they're still planning on doing that the last time I checked. So I actually have a, a, a one little camp at the end of July but all my summer camps for June and July through Lifeway, they've been canceled. Uh, Crossings had to cancel all their camps for June and July. So there's a lot of students out there that, listen, they live for camp in the summer. Camp is life-changing, and they're not going to be able to do that this year. And so uh, they're going to they're gonna hopefully, when we're able to, Savannah, and maybe we can do something special for them or do like a, uh, you know, try to, you can't make up for camp, but we can try to do something uh, for them where uh, we know when we finally get back together, they can go. But uh, support the yard sale, support our students. And so uh, I wanted to let you know about that. Also, uh, I'm going to just say this real quickly about this coming Sunday. Uh, this coming Sunday, we're still following our guidelines that we have the last two weeks. It's good seeing everybody Sunday, but I know, listen, we're still easing, in, easing into this because a lot of churches, this coming Sundays, they're actually their first Sunday that they're returning back to uh, the sanctuary for their worship service. So uh, we've been doing a couple weeks, folks, so it's good seeing everybody, but we're still not ready to, uh, you know, say, hey, we're just going to jump back into this because I don't think that will be wise at this time. So we're trying to do what's best still for the folks at Kevill First Baptist and for our folks keeping us safe and everything and kind of following the guidelines, still kind of watching to see what's taking place and what's happening. So this Sunday, we still will be following the guidelines uh, that were posted. I'll, I'll continue to post them again this week. Uh, they're on the website and they're also on our Facebook page, but I know sometimes the news feed on the Facebook page, it goes by after several days. And it's kind of hard to dig up. So uh, they're on the website. Uh, they're posted there, but uh, I'll post them again and kind of freshen up. If you forgot them, you can freshen up by them. But this Sunday, uh, I, I, I just want to say this. You know, um, the, the, the pastor search team has presented me to the church uh, for, um, you know, the, the pastor's position here. And uh, I'm so humbled by that. And uh, it's a little overwhelming too. Uh, it's exciting, uh, but you know, there's not just a whole lot going on. And, and this is all I really want to kind of say about this. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time, but we're voting this Sunday. And uh, listen, this is very important. Uh, it's an important decision for the church and it's an important decision for me also, and this is what I ask. I ask you, please, 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 every day, as much as possible, please seek God's face in this. Listen, I want 
what God wants. What's best for the church is what God wants. And, and it's such an important decision. Now, that, that, listen, don't just vote, hey, you know, he's been an interim with us, and this is awesome, and, uh, you know, we kind of like this guy or, or, or whatever. Do not vote for that reason. Vote because you know this is God's will. That, that's, that's what I want. Because if it's not, you know, if it's not, if, you, if we don't seek God's face in this, and listen, it, it's, just, it's just a bad deal all the way around uh, if we don't uh, seek God's face and, and, and just like clear everything out of the air and make that the number one priority. Uh, it, it, it must be. It must be confirmed by the Lord. And uh, I just want to say, listen, uh, you have expectations about your pastor. Listen, I have expectations about the church. And, and there's things that we know, whether they're preconceived, whether they're past experiences, whether this, whether whatever it is. Listen, we are, uh, we are in this together. And this is a journey. And it's new for all of us. And, and it's important that the Lord is first and foremost in everything that we do. And, and I think it starts with, 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 the, with the voting. And uh, I, just, I, just, you know, I just ask you, please, please spend a lot of time bathing this in prayer as I have. And I know that you have. Uh, and I know that you haven't been, just, you know, been taking this uh, not seriously. I, I know that you have. But, uh, you know... Um, I will follow the Lord. Uh, I, 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 that, that's listen. That's all I know to do, and and it may it, it may be different. Uh, it might be you know we, we we need to find what what the Lord the direction the Lord wants us to go. It's not anything. It has nothing to do with us. It, it has all to do about about Jesus, right? And uh, I have no agenda on my own. Uh, I want the Lord's agenda. And, and I want the Lord to be first. And I want us to follow him by faith. Uh, you know, listen, I want to be a part. And, and this, is, this, is my, this is my life. This is, this is kind of how I've approached ministry. I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. I want to be a part of something that I know that it's the Lord's doing. Because if we can do it on our own, listen, that's no big deal. But when we do things that we look say, you know what, this is impossible, but God has called us to do it, and we must depend upon God to accomplish this because we can't do it on our own. Listen, when, when, and when we, when we get there and when we accomplish that, what God has called us to do, and we sit back and we're amazed because, oh my goodness, the only way that this could be accomplished is, is through the Lord and because of the Lord. Listen, that's an incredible thing. And, and uh, I, just, I just wanted to... to, to just kind of throw that out there and ask that you pray and seek God's face in this matter as, as you know, Sunday will be here before we know it. And uh, that, that's, that's my heart. Uh, that's what I hope and uh, my desire is. And so uh, I am uh, going to move on from that topic. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. So it's good to have everybody here tonight. Uh, we're starting a new study um, and uh, I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with the book of Jonah. I got to tell you, for me personally, uh, I spend, uh, I don't have a balanced, when, when, and when studying the Bible or preaching from the scripture and stuff like that, or, or just, you know, leading Bible studies, I'm imbalanced. And what I mean by that is I spend more time in the New Testament than I do in the Old Testament. And I really shouldn't do that. I should be balanced. I should spend, you know, equal amount of time in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I, I don't know why that is. It's not because I don't like the Old Testament because I love the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is hugely important. It's just as important now as, as it was when it was written. Because a lot of times it's like, well, that's the Old Testament. That's just like, you know, a long time ago and it doesn't pertain to us. See, that's a lie. Because every bit of it pertains to us. And, 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 and because... Because Jesus is from beginning to the end, right? He's the Alpha and Omega. From the end of the beginning to the Amen and Revelation. Listen, Jesus is woven through uh, the entirety of the Scripture. And it's God's story, okay? It's, 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 it's one book, right? And God is the author. And uh, so I, what I want to do is, is, you know, we spent time in studying Philippians 
And uh, now I want to kind of go to the Old Testament and study Jonah. And so like I did Philippians, uh, we're going to kind of do an, an overview, a background, before we actually get into the text. Now, I printed the notes on the Uversion app, so if you have those, uh, you can kind of follow along and, uh, and, and kind of go along with the notes. Uh, and, and, and I want to look at the background, okay? And, and I just want to kind of look at some background of the Old Testament before we get into, uh, you know, Jonah background. Where does Jonah fit in, okay? Well, the Old Testament, it is a diverse and complex group of books written over a thousand-year period. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, can just, I don't have a Facebook app, but I'm here to Hey, we'll let you, Brother Jeff. It's okay. Uh, Susie will let you watch over her shoulder on her account. So we're glad that you're here, my brother. The Old Testament, it's a, a diverse and complex group of books written over a thousand-year period. In our English Bible, the Old Testament has five divisions, each of which contains a different kind of material. So in your Old Testament, okay, in our translation of the Old Testament, it is broken into five divisions. And the first division is the law, okay? And it's the first five books. It's also known as the Pentateuch. Now, the Pentateuch, the word Pentateuch means five-volume book, all right? That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The second division is history, okay? And it's 12 books. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So we've got law, we've got the history. The third division, the third section, is the wisdom literature, and there's five books in the wisdom literature. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomons. Then we have the fourth section, which is the major prophets. And there's five books in the major prophets. There's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, which was written by Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then it brings us to our fifth division, and it's the minor prophets. There's 12 books in the minor prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Michael, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So, Jonah is in the minor prophets division. Now, the minor prophets are called minor not because they are of lesser importance or inferior, but because of the size of the book. The major prophets cover more material and are larger in size. So if you like take your Bible and you start at Isaiah and go to Daniel and you hold them together, you're looking at like this much, say. Well, if you look at the minor prophets, you're looking at maybe like that much altogether. You've got more material in five books than you do in the 12 books, right? So they're major because they're bigger in size. They're minor because they're smaller in size, not because they're of lesser importance. Uh, Jonah is located in the Old Testament between Obadiah and Micah. So that's just kind of like a little bit of background on the Old Testament, how it's in order and how those sections fit. Now, the historical setting and the timeline. Well, the narrative of Jonah is set in the 8th century BC during the reign of Jeroboam II. He was the king of 10 northern tribes. Jonah follows Hosea and Amos, who are his contemporaries, who also prophesied during the reign, uh, the reign of Jeroboam II. Micah follows Jonah since Micah prophesied after the death of Jeroboam II. In the 8th century, Assyria had already established a hundred-year-old reputation throughout the ancient Near East as a cruel enemy. And near the end of Jonah's life, Assyria was rising to the greatest height of power and terror. And we will look more at Assyria next week in the passages as we begin to break down the chapters. I don't want to talk about Nineveh and Assyria and the empire until we get, it, get there in the first few verses of Jonah chapter 1. The actual story of Jonah, okay, it takes place in multiple locations. But it ends up in the city of Nineveh. It starts out in Joppa. It starts out in route to Tarshish. 
then somewhere between Tarshish and Nineveh in the sea, then Nineveh, and then outside east of the city. So the actual Jonah from, the, from chapter 1, verse 1 to the end, it kind of covers a little bit of distance. Now, that we go from historical setting to the author of Jonah. Now, the book of Jonah contains no explicit reference to an author or to a chronological setting. Now, if we didn't have the reference in 2 Kings 14.25, we would know almost nothing about the his historical situation or the prophet Jonah. It's impossible to know whether the book is by Jonah or only about him. You know, like, uh, it's, it's different. You know, we can say, you know, Daniel wrote Daniel. Isaiah wrote, Z Dan uh, you know, Isaiah wrote Isaiah. Uh, Jeremiah wrote Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote Lamentations. Just like in the Gospels, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts and, you know, so on and so forth. Well, we don't know that about Jonah. Uh, there's very, very even mention about him. And I'll mention this several times. But 2 Kings 14, verse 25, that's about it. We get a little snippet of Jonah. Uh, one of the commentaries I'm reading says this. While understanding Jonah as a historical account, it is unlikely that the main character would have written such a book so consistently critical of himself. Now, if you read, you know, when we begin to read Jonah, it's, it's very critical. And so what this person is saying is that it's most likely if you were to write something about yourself, you wouldn't be so critical about yourself. So it could be somebody that has interviewed him. It could be somebody that went back and interviewed the sailors. It could be somebody that he has told the story through. You know, those kind of things that just, they, they, they Jonah, you know, he was like kind of a, a, an eyewitness, not necessarily an eyewitness, but he was writing the account. The book does not claim authorship by Jonah, or does it contain use of the first person singular? Uh, there's not a statement elsewhere in the scripture that can be used to determine the author. Uh, with that being said, it is possible that he could have written the book uh, following the lead of other prophets. It's possible. Uh, it's, it's not known. Uh, who wrote Jonah? We don't know. That's a question that we can ask the word, or ask Jonah. Hey, who wrote the book of Jonah? And he could tell us. And so uh, for our study and for now, we don't know. It could have been somebody else uh, who we don't know, or it could have been Jonah uh, that, who was being very critical of himself, but it's probably most likely not because we have a tendency when we write stuff about ourselves, we don't kind of really write all that much stuff about that's critical about ourselves. Now, here is a few notes about Jonah. Uh, this book is different from other prophetic books in that this book is about the prophet instead of a book by the prophet. It's a story about a prophet, not a book by the prophet. It's not like he's writing, this is what I prophesy. In content and form, it resembles a narrative concerning the prophets in the historical books of the Old Testament more than it does the other prophetic books. Remember, uh, the second division of the Old Testament is the history books. There's 12 books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd King, 1st, 2nd Chronicle, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. It actually, in content and writing, is more in line with the historical books than it is the actual prophetic books. The book of Jonah is only 48 verses long, uh, four chapters, 48 verses. Now, what do we know about Jonah? We don't really know a whole lot, but we know a little bit. We know that he was a successful prophet. Uh, was like, well, he doesn't sound very successful in Jonah. Well, we have a little bit more, and it's found in 2 Kings chapter 14. By the time of the story, Jonah, he had answered the prophetic call, okay? This, this call to Nineveh from God was not his first adventure. He, he was... He was, he'd already answered the prophetic call. He was already preaching in Israel, okay? The narrative of 2 Kings 14 shows that Jonah preached the word of the Lord to Jeroboam, who was a wicked king in Israel, and it was through Jonah's preaching that Jeroboam, too, fixed Israel's border that had been weakened during the early conflicts with Assyria, 
This kept Israel from being blotted out as a people. So if you have your Bibles, if you flip over to 2 Kings uh, chapter 14, starting in verse, let me see, verse, uh, verse about midway through, uh, let's say uh, verse 25, uh, he restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amatai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. So he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So, so he was... You know, he was already on the scene. He'd already been prophesied. He'd already been preaching. So uh, Jonah wasn't his first gig, if you will. Going to Nineveh wasn't his first gig or his first calling. Uh, he was quite successful. He preached uh, in Jeroboam the second listen, and God kind of did some restoration there. The book of Jonah reveals the sovereignty of God, the call of God, the providence of God, and the miraculous element of Jonah being swallowed by a great fish. And in the fourth chapter, we discover the heart of the book. Now also, Jonah predicts in type form the death and resurrection of Jesus. Matthew 12, 38 through 41. If you want to flip over to the New Testament, because this is the New Testament connection and reference and we'll probably talk about that quite a bit, too, as we go through this, because it's, it's hugely, hugely important. Uh, Matthew 12, 38 through 41. This is, uh, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, to answer him, Jesus, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seek for a sign, but no sign will be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. He's like, listen, you've had your sign. I'm not giving you one. Jonah's the sign. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So uh, it's, a, it's a type of Christ, right, as her picture there. Now, Jonah is a type of Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm talking about typology. Uh, typology is a method of biblical interpretation whereby an element found in the Old Testament is seen to prefigure one found in the New Testament. And there are a lot of types of Christ found through the Old Testament. That's a great study if you ever want to start in Genesis and just go through and say, hey, where are the types of Christ? Listen, Adam was a type of Christ. Uh, the ark is a type of Christ. How is the ark a type of Christ? Well, the ark that Noah was saved in was not a selling vessel. It was not built or designed to sell. Okay, it was a saving vessel. It saved people from destruction. The ark floated on the water. It had no navigation system, right? Uh, except for God, just it, it floated. But it was a symbol. It was a type of Christ. It was a saving vessel. Listen, so much in the temple, so much in the tabernacle, all the instruments, they're types of Christ, okay? They're, they're, they're Old Testament that point to Jesus in the New Testament. Well, there's a lot of them in Jonah. Well, if you look at that, uh, Jonah and Jesus can be compared favorably in many ways. Well, both were from Galilee. Both preached God's message of judgment and reconciliation to the marginalized and to the sinners. Both chose death uh, forsaken by others. You know, uh, Jonah uh, was thrown overboard. He says, throw me overboard in order to lay, uh, save the lives of pagan sailors, Right. Uh, both caused a storm to cease after sleeping through it. 
Uh, Jonah was in the bottom of the boat, right, sleeping when the ship was getting ready to be destroyed by the storm that God had created. Jesus was asleep in the boat when the storm came up on the Sea of Galilee. And, and they both said, you know, Jonah stopped. He said, throw me overboard. The storm will cease. Jesus calms the storm. He says, peace be still. Uh, Jonah enters the jaws of the fish. Jesus entered the jaws of the grave. Both were kept for three days. Uh, both were raised up again by the Father. Jonah was spit out onto dry land. He was raised up, uh, you know, as a type of Christ. And both was raised up by the Father. Jonah's obedience and preaching led to the conversion of a great city. Jesus' obedience led to the conversion of many tribes and tongues of the world. So there's many comparisons there as we read through. Uh, as in Philippians, you remember that the word joy or rejoice was, uh, excuse me, just a minute, was used, uh, it, was, it was a word that was used throughout the letter. Well, in Jonah, the word great, G-R-E-A-T, great, uh, is, is used uh, 15 times. The Hebrew word, the Hebrew root is used 15 times in the book. Most of the places, emotions and events are called great. Uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 1, the great city, excuse me, verse 2, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. Uh, verse 4, chapter 1, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest. Well, that word mighty is great. Uh, if you go on down to uh, chapter 1, verse 10, then the men were exceedingly afraid. Well, exceedingly, that root word is great. Uh, you go over to verse 12, it says, he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it's because of me the great tempest has come. Uh, then 16, and the men feared the Lord exceedingly. There again is the root word great. Uh, verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish. If you jump on over to chapter 3, verse 2, arise, go to this Nineveh, that great city. Uh, down in verse 3, uh, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Uh, they called for a fast and put sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Verse 5, chapter 3. Uh, in verse 7, and he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. That word nobles means great ones. Uh, chapter 4, but it, displeased, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Uh, great was right there. Uh, verse 6, so Jonah was exceedingly glad. Uh, once again, the root word great. Verse 10, and the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow. Uh, make it grow, uh, the word is, is great there. Uh, and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city? So 15 times, that's a word that goes through. And each time that we go through those verses, we'll kind of look at that. What does that actually mean that something's great? Not Tony the Tiger, it's great. But, you know, that's kind of a word to kind of keep your eye on. Another note for Jonah that we need to keep in mind, the fish, the great fish, the whale is a relatively minor part of the story. It's mentioned in only three verses, but somehow the great fish winds up getting top billing in the story. We're going to look more at the great fish debate next week when we get into that passage. Now, interpreting Jonah. There are three basic interpretations of the book of Jonah. Number one, it is the mythological approach. This is a liberal view which looks upon Jonah as a tale or legendary material. For them, Jonah and the whale is characterized with other fables involving interaction with animals such as the boy who cried wolf or the snake and the traveler. And one of the main reasons for this approach is skeptics believe that it is impossible for a fish to swallow a man and that a man live inside its belly for three days and then be barfed out on dry land and everything is okay, okay? One such scholar by the name of J.A. Brewer, I don't know who that is. It's just a scholar, somebody way smarter than me, book-wise. They say this, to believe Jonah as unhistorical is the supported incredibility of its account. 
to believe Jonah should have remained in the fish for three days and three nights and should have prayed a beautiful psalm of thanksgiving inside exceeds the limits of credibility. Now, J.A. Brewer and other scholars that believe this, they do not submit to the scripture as the very words of God. I remember many, many years ago, Martha Stewart saying this. Now I know what you're thinking right now. Tim, I'm really shocked by the fact that you were watching Martha Stewart. I wasn't watching Martha Stewart. This was Martha Stewart's pre-prison days before she was arrested and went to prison, right? She had a show on TV, and it was probably on TV. And she's in the kitchen cooking and baking. And I remember her saying this from years ago. And she was talking about decorating something. And she says, one of my favorite fables is Noah's Ark. And that's one of her favorite fables, right? Listen, Noah's Ark is not a fable. Jonah and the story about Jonah being swallowed by a great fish is not a fable. These people deny scripture as God's word. They deny the truth of Jonah. Listen, if they deny the truth of Jonah, if you and I deny the truth of Jonah, we're going to deny the truth. Listen, it's impossible for that to happen. Then we're going to say, well, you know what? Noah's ark is just a fable. And we're going to deny the truth of Noah and the ark. Then what happens is, is you get to the Old Testament. Well, I deny the, the literal creation of, of, of six days. I, I, I deny the literal fact, you know, or the historical fact or the truth in the scripture about Noah and the ark. I deny the fact that Jonah, you know, was swallowed by a great fish and lived there for three days and three nights and was spit up on dry land. When we begin to deny those things, what happens is, is I deny the fact that Jesus died on a cross and was raised from the dead. See, that's what it starts. Listen, we, we, that, that's, that's the mythological approach, okay? Now, the second approach of interpretation is the allegorical approach. In this view, the book is merely an extended parable. Jonah is really Israel. The sea is the Gentile nation. The fish is the Babylonian captivity. And the regurgitation is the return during Ezra's time. Um, I will apologize to you because in my notes I have a lot of typos. And I apologize for that because I hate typos. But sometimes I type really fast and I don't catch them. And I don't have anybody to proofread them for me. So if you see that, uh, those are typos. And I apologize for those because I just found one in point two. The third way is the literal historical approach. This alone is the correct view, okay? Number three, the literal historical approach is the correct view. There's no others. It can't be a combination of, well, it's a historical, literal, but it's also allegorical. It's literal, historical, or it's mythological, a little bit, a little bit. No, it's not. It's the literal historical approach is the correct view, okay? Listen, the account presents itself as actual history, okay? Just like... George Washington was our first president. Just like we have historical proof of Gettysburg, just like we have historical proof of our nation's history, uh, Independence Day, Paul Revere's ride, Betsy Ross and the flag, whatever it may be that we have in our history book that is true, we know it. Listen, it's true. It's historical. It's actually happened. Here's why. We got, listen, the Jews in the early church believed that it was true. The Jewish historian Josephus used it in his first century account of Jewish history. The early church fathers treated this book not only as historical fact, but also as prophecy confirming the power of God to raise the dead. Listen, the author of 2 Kings 14 through 25 refers to Jonah as a historical person. He gives his hometown he gives the name of his father. He gives the name of the king he served under. Jesus testified to the literal account of Jonah. See, Jesus did not see Jonah as a parable or an allegory. And to me, this point is the one that really only matters to me. Jesus believed it because it was true. Listen, Jesus 
was there. Jesus created everything that was happened. Jesus was part of the process. Listen, Jesus taught it as truth, as a real person. And when Jesus taught it, the people's like, yes, we know exactly what we're talking about. Listen, the witness of Jesus was apparently the basis for the early church linking the historical accuracy of Jonah's experience with that of Jesus, especially his resurrection. But here's the thing about Jonah. The story of Jonah is troubling to, for people to see, right? How can a fish swallow a man and that man stay in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights? The issue or the problem is not the fish or the improbability of the account. Okay? That's not the problem. In our highly sophisticated, technologically advanced, scientific age, we have become thrown off from the point of the story and started saying something like this is not possible, okay? We have got so smart, we know so much, and we're so scientific that it's thrown us off the, the, the whole point of the story of saying, you know what? Something like this is not impossible. But you know what? Of course it's not possible because it's a miracle. It's a straight up miracle. That's why it's not possible. Listen, miracles by definition are outside the normal course of nature. Having absolute knowledge and power in the universe, the Lord could appoint or raise up or even create any sea creature he wanted to swallow Jonah. Okay? It's a miracle. I, I, I love what one writer says. I, I love this. I, I just like, I was like, Oh yeah, this is amazing. And, and I wish I would have thought of it because uh, I, I want to share it with you. He says this, If the story had said that the Lord sent a shrimp to swallow Jonah, I would believe it. You could argue with me repeatedly that there's no way a shrimp could eat a man or that a man could stay inside a shrimp for three days. If the scripture had said, the Lord raised up a shrimp and it swallowed Jonah, it would be true. God is sovereign creator. He could create a shrimp way bigger than Jumbo that could swallow a man whole. I, I love that because it's a miracle. And because God is so big, there's nothing impossible for God. And, and I'm just, I'm like, I, I love that. I love that. Now there's a, a scholar named Jay Walton. I'm not familiar with him either. But he says this in reference to miracles. He says the greatest miracle is not the gullet size and geographical habitats of dozens of well species or the chemical content of mammalian digestive juices and their projected effect on human epidermis over prolonged periods. He says the greatest miracle is that God talked to man as he did to Jonah. That's the miracle of it all. It's that God, the creator of the heavens and the universe, spoke to Jonah. And it's over and over again in the book of Jonah. He repeatedly has this dialogue with Jonah. Listen, the entire book of Jonah is a book of miracles, not just about one fish swallowing a man. Listen, chapter 1, verse 4, it's the sudden provincial storm. That's a miracle. The falling of the lot upon Jonah in verse 7 of chapter 1 is a miracle. The immediately calming of the storm in verse 15, chapter 1, miracle. The divinely appointed fish, verse 17, miracle. The divinely appointed vine in chapter 4, verse 6, miracle. The divinely appointed worm in verse 7, chapter 4, miracle. The scorching wind, miracle in chapter 4, verse 8. Listen. This entire book of Jonah is one big, whopping, God-sized miracle. And, and it's incredible. But what happens is, is we get wrapped up in a fish. And, and, and what I want to hope to do through this is I hope that we don't get wrapped up in the fish. That we get wrapped up in a great God. Now, here's the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book 
is to instruct God's people more fully in the character of their God, particularly in his mercy as it operates in relation to repentance. It's not about Jonah. It's not about a great fish. It's not about Nineveh. It's about a merciful God. It's the purpose of the book. And, and, and that's what we need to see in every verse as we read it. Now there's an outline, and the outline kind of goes like this. The first number one in the outline is Jonah, Jonah's call and his reaction. Chapters one, verses one through three. Number two in the outline is in the storm at sea. Chapter one, verses four through 16. Number three in the outline is prayer in the fish. Uh, that starts in chapter 1, verse 17, and goes through chapter 2 to verse 10. Uh, outline number 4 in the outline, Jonah's second call and reaction. Uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3a. Number 5 in the outline is in Nineveh. Starts in chapter 3, 3b, second part of uh, verse 3, and goes through verse 10. Uh, number 6 in the outline is prayer in Nineveh. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And then the last part of the outline, number 7 in that line, is God's questions outside of Nineveh. Chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. So, here is a recap synopsis. And this is really based upon sermons I've heard in the past from others on Jonah. All right? Jonah is not about a man swallowed by a great fish. It's only three verses, is at the beginning. Jonah is not a story about moral choices and the consequences. Uh, Walt Disney's Pinocchio, if you're familiar with Walt Disney, they took the story of Jonah, they replaced Jonah with Pinocchio, and he was swallowed by a whale as punishment to teach a moral lesson to Pinocchio. Jonah is not a story about moral choices and consequences. Now, you've probably heard this one preached over and over and over again, as well as I have. Jonah is not about a disobedient preacher running from the call of God, okay? Jonah is not about Jewish nationalism and a prejudiced preacher refusing to share the gospel to the Gentiles, even though there is a hint of this in Jonah, okay? And there is a lesson about being disobedient and running from the call of God. That is not what Jonah is about. There are other lessons found in Jonah. There's lessons about monotheism, uh, pagans following multiple gods, polytheism, and, and coming to the one true God. There's lessons about obedience that we can learn. There's lessons about motivation. There's lessons about missions. There's lessons about racism, which are very, very important in the world that we're living in today. There's lessons about fear and doubt and anger. Listen, there's lessons about that that are found throughout Jonah. But Jonah is about a merciful God that offers forgiveness to those who repent of sin and turn to him. Listen, that's what it's all about. And that's going to be the approach that we take. We're going to break the scripture down as, uh, as we go through this, just like we did in Philippians. We have a few minutes left. I just want to kind of begin to read some of it, kind of get a head start. I hope that you have kind of read it. Uh, now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Mighty, saying, Rise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call it against it, for their evil has come before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship threatened to break up. And then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down to the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, uh, that we may know of whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. 
And they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew and I am fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. And when they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up, hurl me into the sea and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging, and the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Chapter 2. And Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surround me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountain. I went down the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought me up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord, and when my prayer came to you into your holy temple. And those who pay regard to the vain idols forsake their hope and steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed. I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Chapter 3. And when the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, call out against it, and the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breath. Jonah began to go into the city, to go into a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days of Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people in Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and the nobles, let neither man nor beast nor herd uh, nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Chapter 4, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and set to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till the, she should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head and save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on his head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which it came into being in a night and perished in a night. I should I not pity in Nineveh, that great city in which there is more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. So there you go. We just read it. So I encourage you to, to read chapter one this week and kind of make some notes and stuff. And so uh, 
I'm excited, I hope that you are too, to learn some great stuff about our God through the book of Jonah. Uh, if you have anything that you need, uh, oh, I also, I forgot to make the, I made myself a note right here, the blessing box. The blessing box, is, it was empty when I pulled up. So uh, if you have some things for the blessing box, if you come by, drop them off. If you need somebody to come by and pick them up, please let us know so we can kind of get that restocked, get some things in that. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, yes, he was. There's a lot of patience there, uh, my sister. And just, uh, he's really patient with me too. And I, I praise God for that, that he was long suffering. Uh, so the blessing box, I wanted to make sure to let you know that need that uh, uh, I couldn't see much of anything uh, in there. I think it's empty. So if you have some stuff that you can bring by for that. If you need anything this week from me, please, please do not hesitate to contact me. You can call, you can text, you can email, Facebook Messenger, you can leave a message at church office, you can email the church, any of those forms you can get to me, but uh, you can get a hold of me uh, if you need anything. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of the week. I hope that your face and the top of your head hasn't got sunburned like mine because, listen, uh, I painted out in the sun, which was a glorious day, but I don't really have much coverage on my head. So you might be saying, hey, you fool, they make a thing called a hat, and it's a wonderful invention, and you should put one of those on your head when you go out in the sun. Well, I did that a little bit later. I didn't start out in a hat, and you're exactly correct, but I got that covered. But I love the sunshine, and I love being out in the sun, and so it's been a gorgeous week this week. And uh, I, I appreciate you all. So have a great week. If you need anything from me, uh, please, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thanks for joining us tonight. And thanks for being here as we kind of kicked off our study for Jonah. And be in prayer this week. We've got a, a, a big, exciting Sunday. Uh, listen, we got the vote Sunday. But more importantly, listen, uh, it, it's about hearing from God and the Word of God and the message and I don't want anything to distract from the message of God. Not because it's me, but because it's the Word of God. And we want God to, to speak to us. And so, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, yeah, that's right, Michael. I need, when I'm out there in the sun, I need that vine. Uh, fortunately, there was like a lot of poison ivy lingering in that area. That's one vine. I do not want shading me. Uh, so, uh, I don't like that stuff either. You all have a great week. And you be blessed. And I love you, church. And uh, if you need anything, please, please let us know. If not, for those that can join us on Sunday in person, uh, we we'll, can't wait to see you. And for those that still need a little more time, listen, Facebook Live will be there Sunday too. And, and we'll see you there as well as we join together as a body and worship uh, the God that creates the universe and loves us and gave his son for us. And so you have a great week and we will see you soon.